And the examples of people having to write in code to get their meaning across, philosophers like Spinoza, for example, permanently aware of how the heavy hand of the secular arm of the Inquisition might fall on them, had to conduct themselves. We have, I think, absolutely no right to forget that, to forget the fact that only one copy of Lucretius's De Rerum Naturum, one of the great contributions to culture and civilization ever made, as well as the first discovery of the atomic theory, very nearly didn't survive the Christian centuries at all. Only one copy, in fact, did make it, it helped to inspire people like Galileo, whose fate, of course, stood as a permanent reminder to people of what would happen to them if they, uh, if they didn't appear to be uh, sufficiently devout. So I think if I haven't made that point by now, I'll have failed to make it if I elaborate any further. I think I just want to say, and this should probably be in conclusion, I don't have a stopwatch either, is that we are now in the position that uh, I occupy, try to occupy, in my little book about the Parthenon. Uh, the Parthenon is a building without which I could not do. I don't know about any of you, but if, if you try and imagine European civilization without that, as Eliot invites us to imagine European civilization without monotheism, it's pretty hard to do. A tremendous work and involving largely, this, with some slavery, but not much, largely the work of free citizens, artists and artisans of Athens. Inspired quite clearly by, by, by faith, nobody knows anything about that religion anymore, really. Certainly nobody bothers with those gods, nobody practices the Eleusinian mysteries. That's all gone. But the tremendous contribution made by it stays with us. So what I think we have to be talking about, Professor Brummett and I, among other things, is one of my favorite words, Hegel's word, Auf Hebel, um, transcendence. How do we, as a civilization and a culture, retain what is of value and of beauty and of instruction in the contributions gifted to us by the past from the years and decades and uh, centuries of faith, while discarding perfect timing, while discarding the, the superstition, the, the theocracy, the censorship, the torture, the intimidation that were at just as necessary to that system and just as much part of its legacy to us. Um, thank you very much. Mr. Christopher Hitchens, thank you very much for your opening statement. Somewhat creative interpretation of 10 minutes, but not, not too far off. Uh, your opening statement, Dr. Barry Brummett. Yes, thank you, and, and what an honor it is to be here today and to share the stage, albeit electronically, with uh, Mr. Hitchens. Um, it is, of course, Mr. Hitchens' uh, long uh, legacy and, and uh, work in attacking the extremisms of religion, uh, which provide the framework for us to be here tonight. Um, so I think my prepared remarks are going to try to address our um, resolution within that context, and then in my uh, five minutes later on, I'll talk more about his, uh, I thought, very interesting statements. At the start of his celebrated uh, treatise on rhetoric, Aristotle makes a very interesting distinction. He says, on the one hand, we have decisions that we have to make for which we have no sure and certain systems to guide us. Who do you vote for? What do I do about my um, um, interpersonal relationships? Do I spank my kid? Do I buy that used car? And he says, because we have no sure and certain systems for those kinds of decisions, we have to talk it out, and that means that we have to turn to rhetoric and dialectic, he said. And I think our descendants' rhetoric and dialectic today would include, although not be limited to, uh, such activities as literature, television, film, and so forth. Many of us uh, get clues as to how to live those um, parts of our lives from those sources. On the other hand, he says, we have decisions to make for which we do have sure and certain systems to guide us. If you want to know the area of a circle, you take a measurement, you apply the formula, no one debates about the area of a circle, okay? Seems like a very reasonable sort of distinction. But I think it sets up a great temptation, and that is the temptation to move managements of our everyday issues 
from rhetoric and dialectic and, and the messiness that that involves over to sure and certain systems, right? Because wouldn't you really like someone to tell you once and for all what you should do in life? Wouldn't you like someone to tell you whether you should spank your child or not? <laughs> Otherwise, you do the wrong thing and then 20 years later the kid climbs a library tower with a 30 out 6 and it's your fault. <laughs> I, take, I take from from this great temptation, what I would call a rhetorical definition of extremism. And I think rhetorically extremism is what happens when people assert that they have a sure and certain system to guide decisions, which really ought to be made uh, through rhetorical and dialectic and, and cultural means. And let me just say in general, I think that uh, having uh, looked at Mr. Hitchens uh, work over the years, I think I am uh, probably appalled by many of the same things that he is appalled by. But I think I find a different causality. And I want to talk about um, extremisms as being that causality, but not only re religious extremisms. I think uh, extremisms, both religious and secular, are the source of many of our problems. And if I, I think if we don't understand that, then we will not understand religions which are not extremist, and we will not see uh, secular belief systems which are extremist. When I talk about extremism, I, I want to look at the form or the pattern of extremism. I think that's more important than the content of religious or secular uh, extremisms. And I want to point to three kinds of form uh, that I think underlie this sort of extremism. The first is what I would call dogmatic fundamentalism. And that's what happens when someone um, is, is a prophet, when someone has found some sort of uh, secular text, and they attempt to treat that as a sure and certain system which will tell us absolutely what we should uh, do in life. Now, obviously, you, you find that in, in religious circles, uh, um, in religious belief. But I think you find it elsewhere uh, also. And let me just give one sort of example. I've known many people. Um, who began life with a very dogmatic and fundamentalist upbringing. And then later in life, they just couldn't do that anymore. They could not, they could not uh, uh, hold to those religious beliefs. But they shifted that sort of dogmatic fundamentalism to something else. In my experience, most often health. And, and they, they grab hold of some sort of health doctrine and health text, and, and they become as, as dogmatic as, as any primitive Baptist preacher uh, telling you, you know, what, what you should do, except now it's about what you ought to eat as opposed to, to what you ought to believe. So I think dogmatic fundamentalism is the first kind of extremism in the sense that, that I mean it. Secondly, I would point to apocalyptic belief, and I've done... Uh, some research on this, um, an apocalyptic belief is what happens when someone gets hold of some uh, ancient or grounding text and they say, uh, I, I have a sure and certain system for understanding this text and it means the world is going to end next Wednesday. In the United States, at any rate, we just had uh, Harold Camping, uh, a minister, tell us that the world is going to end on May 21st. Um, sadly, for students preparing for final exams, it did not. Um, <laughs> Now he says, well, it's October, 20, uh, uh, October 21st, but this time he really means it. Um, I think that's an extremism, and I think it's um, offering as a sure and certain text something that you really can't know as a sure and certain text. In fact, the Bible says you can't, but that doesn't, that doesn't stop people like the Reverend Camping. Um, in my study of apocalyptic, what has fascinated me, though, is I've looked at all kinds of apocalyptic discourse. People who think the world will end because of World War III, or ecological matters, or economic matters, or, or you name it, and they all follow the same form or pattern. I think this is something deeply ingrained in people. And finally, the tendency towards perfection, or what is sometimes called uh, teleology. Uh, of course, there is no perfection in nature, but people will sometimes uh, give you the, the, the ad advice as, as to how one uh, can, can perfect oneself. And I think some ways of, of thinking are more disposed toward perfectionism than others. Now here I think Mr. Hitchens is definitely on to something because I think religion is one of those areas which lends itself uh, toward, toward perfectionism, toward thinking that, that, uh, that one can come up with a perfect solution uh, to, to life's problems. But I don't think it's the only one. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's a pattern that we find. Well, what's to be done? And again, because this is a, a conference on rhetoric and because I'm a rhetorician, I want to offer three rhetorical solutions as, as to how we can address this problem of extremism, whether we find it in, in uh, uh, religious circles or, or non-religious circles. 
The first thing is, that I would suggest is to turn to rhetoric's long and somewhat uneven tradition of both affirmation and critique. Uh, rhetoric has, uh, throughout history, taught people what they ought to say so they can affirm something, so they can defend some sort of proposition, so they can get up in a speech and, and say what they think they believe, but rhetoric has also taught people how to critique and how to think about what is wrong with this proposition, uh, where, where are the holes in this. I think a lot of um, uh, what, what you see in, in, in people who are uh, being extremist for one reason or another, perhaps, is a failure of that second kind of training. But it really is a kind of rhetorical education. And I think people who are in the job of, of educating need to think about how to train people, both how do you say yes, and how do you say I'm not so sure. Second thing is, I think we need to train people in the schools uh, as to how to exploit the resources of ambiguity. Now, religion has a long history of being able to do this very well. It's called casuistry. But any religious system, in fact, any system whatsoever that's going to last for any period of time is going to have ambiguities. And, and, and they provide a way to exploit that system and, and, and to suggest alternative ways of, of thinking. Um, but people need to be trained in, in how to, in how to, to uh, exploit those ambiguities. Um, re religion depends on this. No religion is going to last more than two weeks if it tells you that, you that you must wear a pointed yellow hat every Thursday evening at 5 o'clock. None of them are that specific. They are all vague. They are all ambiguous. Uh, and, and, so I, and, and exploiting that is, is one way that you can do that. If you want a literary cultural example of that, look at um, Inherit the Wind and look at the ways in which uh, uh, the, the character of uh, Clarence Darrow uh, exploited the uh, ambiguities in William Jennings Bryan's um, fundamentalism. And I think that provides a good example. Uh, the last uh, solution I would suggest is to go sophistic. Uh, to become sophist, and the sophist cultivated uh, the study of what was called the disoi logoi, which is to say uh, there are two sides to every question. And uh, before you get up to speak on any question, think about what could be said on the other side of that question. Um, one of my favorite authors, his book is rather old now, but uh, Mark Backman um, wrote a book called Sophistication. I highly recommend it. He argues that we have become sophists in our time. Uh, I would say perhaps not enough and not enough of us. But I think training people to be able to say that whatever it is that you affirm, whatever it is that, that you uh, are inclined to visit upon other people as this is a, a true way to think, Stop and ask yourself, what's the other way to think? What's, what could be said on the other side? And that's, that's very much a rhetorical way of thinking. Always think about what can be said on, on both sides of, of the question. Uh, again, I, I think I'll reserve for my uh, second statement some, uh, some answers to what, what I thought were uh, uh, Mr. Hitchens' very interesting and uh, provocative remarks. Um, and I will, I will now yield the rest of my time, as they say. Well, you just, uh, you came in at 9.56, so you yielded four seconds, but that's quite remarkable. Either you're, uh, uh, you're very, very good at timing your, your comments or you're very lucky, but uh, well done. There are your opening statements. So uh, our second round is five minute moments uh, of rebuttal. So it's quite obvious the way this is going to play out. Mr. Hitchens for five minutes, Mr. Brummett for five minutes, and then once again. So, uh, Mr. Hitchens, I go to you for five minutes, sir. All right. Um, if you notice, the examples I adduce of um, religions often hostile, attitude to culture or to what makes it possible, which is independent thought, uh, free inquiry and freedom of expression is not a matter of extremists. All the examples I deduced were from the mainstream practice of the religious establishment of civilized Europe for many, many centuries. Um, I don't believe I instanced any hedge priests or Savonarola types or anything of this sort. These were, these were statements or positions, policies that had the force of something more than moral law for millions of people and were enforceable. Um, I sometimes grow tired of those who 
seek to say, yes, well, there are extremists and fundamentalists and there are things, terrible things are done and said in the name of religion or sometimes in the name of God. It's not in the name of. 